All right, so now I want to shift gears to a very important topic that I found very useful when it comes to trying to think about the manifesting topic. And that's the idea of specific intention versus general attitude. In other words, uh, trying to manifest something specifically through a particular very specific intention versus merely having a, a general attitude or a general mindset that you're holding. Because whether you're trying to manifest something specific or whether you just hold a general positive attitude, both of those things will manifest things in your life, right? But they're clearly very different methods. Uh, for example, you know, when it comes to having specific intentions, it can easily backfire. And I'll explain that more in a moment. Uh, but at the same time, when you do something very specific, like when you intend like this detail, that detail, that requirement, that requirement, at the same time, that also closes a lot of these gotcha loopholes that can happen. You know, a lot of times you intend for something, but you forgot to include, you know, A, B, and C. So therefore it kind of backfires because you didn't put that as part of your intention. All right. You know, that's, that's a pretty common phenomenon, but it's one of the traps that can happen with being specific. Okay. As opposed to having a more general attitude, like a general mindset or vibe that you're holding, where you're not intending for anything specific, but nonetheless, you're pulling something in. And one example of that would be my awe, my wonder experiment, mm -hmm. where all these random things were happening, which I didn't intend for specifically, but it definitely fulfilled my general vibe that I was putting out, which was a sense of wonder, a sense of shock, a sense of awe, okay? So in life, people think about reality creation only in terms of, oh, you know, I'm doing this particular ritual or this particular immersion visualization exercise in order to get what I want, not realizing that their entire normal general attitude throughout the day is reality creating already. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that includes mundanity, too. See, people think that by default, reality is not magical at all. And it's only when you do these exercises, so these particular techniques, that's when you pull in something through some magical way. That's how you get uh, an intentional synchronicity or, you know, some, some weird opportunity or something. But in fact, no, that's not, I mean, that's not only it. It's that you're reality creating all the time. And if you're in a mundane mindset 24, you know, seven, well, at least when you're awake, if you're in a mundane mindset, you're manifesting a mundane reality. It's going on constantly. So it's, it's merely a matter of shifting your, your default general attitude mindset. And that's what kind of creates the overall tone of your life. And then anything you do specific, whether through uh, one of these immersion exercises or merely innocently daydreaming something or being in that mind awake, half you know, body sleep state or in a lucid dream, that's more like icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's an addition to it. So that's like the garnish that you put on the cake, but the cake itself is being baked by your general mindset. Foundation has to be there. Yeah, exactly. And so that can be both for good and for bad, right? I mean, if you have a general default good personality and a mindset, then that'll increase the amount of luck and flow and ease in your life. Right. And I can attest to that because there's actually something I wrote about on my um, Gab last year, I believe it was. I, I did a post regarding the idea of the Pollyanna mindset. Um, which comes from the movie Pollyanna, which actually comes from the original book that the movies were based on. But um, I did this post where I was kind of talking about how throughout my entire life, I've always had this need to look on the bright side of things and how I always have just seen the glass as being half full, like on an unconscious level. Like without realizing what I was saying, I would say that the glass is half full, showing what my true unconscious subconscious state really was, which was uh, like an optimistic, positive state um, and I think why I, I, Pollyanna, the 1960 Disney version, was one of my favorite movies. I just, I don't know, just something about that movie. It was really cool on different levels, not just because of the whole Pollyanna positive attitude, but there's other aspects of that movie that were really cool too. But um, that was just that movie resonated with me because that was kind of like my lifelong attitude. So, you know, like in life, anytime anything goes wrong, I've always kind of automatically looked for how much worse things could have been. And, you know, have that basis of comparison to be grateful for how much worse things didn't go. And it sounds so simple, but you'd be amazed about how many people do not think like this. They do not go through life thinking like this. So it's like on some level, they think life is always supposed to be, you know, rainbows and unicorns. So when things are not going 100% perfect at all times, it's like a catastrophe and the world ends, you know, this dramatic negative response and really upset that it's like a childish temper tantrum almost where 
they just think life is supposed to be easy and flowing at all times and they have meltdowns whenever anything doesn't go the way they thought it was supposed to go. Um, so just because they're thinking that life should be going positively, obviously they're still like, it's not, <laughs> it's something's still off kilter there. They're not getting in the right frequency here. What you want to do is just, you just always are in a state of, you understand that problems are going to happen. You know, life isn't perfect. It doesn't just flow perfectly all the time. But when or if things do go wrong, you know, just try to have that basis of comparison and, you know, realize how much worse it could have been and have gratitude. And I don't know, it's just because I've been able to, to see how, because I've been able to do that, I've been able to see how I actually have protection at work in my reality. It's just loosened me up or relaxed me to see how higher stuff is at work, um, helping to minimize, if not flat out undo accidents and no-nos, which, I mean, again, I got a lot of anecdotes about this to back it up, but I have actually, yeah, definitely seen these higher forces at work, you know, helping me out and undoing and minimizing things. So being appreciative and grateful and optimistic, it's necessary for mental and spiritual well-being, not just for me, but for everybody. And so that, that would be a big bit of advice I would give to people listening to this right now is if you're not already somebody who isn't feeling gratitude and optimism, just try to get in that mindset. And when things go wrong, just be a little bit more matter of fact and nonchalant about it and just have a basis of comparison. It doesn't have to be the end of the world. You know, don't, don't be like a, a child having a temper tantrum and feeling entitled to life being perfect for you. Cause you know, it isn't, there's going to be hiccups and speed bumps and, um, and we're actually going to, you know, touch on the idea of, and I, or maybe we did, did we already touch on the idea of how sometimes negative things can actually be for our better, you know, mm -hmm. good. Yeah. We actually, we talked about it. We've been talking for a long time. So it's hard to remember some of what we talked about at the very beginning. But, you know, keep that in mind, too, that just because a bad thing is happening, you don't understand, maybe you won't understand f until a little bit further down the line why it was necessary and it wasn't as bad as what you thought it was, uh, wasn't the end of the world, and it was almost like a catalyst to get you from point A to point B, which you didn't realize when you're in the middle of it, but you only see it in retrospect. But, you know, I, I just, I feel like, you know, if I had only complained all the time in life and could only see the negative and the ugly, you know, I, I truly feel like it would kill me. Like, I cannot exist like that. I, it's almost like a pathological need to have this Pollyanna mindset, just keeping optimistic and matter of fact and grateful and basis of comparison at all times. And interestingly enough, and I talked about this in my book, Chasing Phantoms, I actually experienced... Um, my lab's MK programming designed specifically to stop this trait in me because negative stuff knew that, you know, this is how I'm operating and it's really helping me out in life and they need to stop that. So I, th there was an anecdote I, I wrote about. It was about 2003. Um, we were living in Fort Lauderdale. So I woke up one morning um, and I busted them, whatever them is. It was human male voices that seemed to correlate to the MyLab's memories that I've had. Um, but they were trying to instill, basically, you could call it um, subconscious nocturnal programming, direct into the brain while I was sleeping. Um, but I happened to wake up and catch them. And the thing that was being programmed over and over again was, you will only see what's wrong and ugly in the world. You will only see what's wrong and ugly in the world in this like male voice commanding me in a forceful way over and over and over. And something about that broke through and actually caused me to wake up and, you know, busted them in, in the process of doing that programming. Um, but again, I feel like they were doing this because they knew the effect it would have on my entire reality. Because, because I operate in such a, a positive way. And like you were just explaining, that's like the base foundation frequency you're operating at already. That's half the battle. And everything else is just icing on the cake. So I'm operating at this kind of higher, grateful, positive, optimistic, cheerful, Pollyanna sort of mentality, despite negative things that have happened in life. I'm still kind of la la la, happy and optimistic and feeling like my options are limitless and the whole world is my oyster and it's a big open-ended future and all this positive, genuinely thinking that on the deep subconscious level, then when I'm 
doing reality creation, usually inadvertently without realizing it really works because <laughs> the base foundation is there. Then you add the icing on the cake and it just really falls into place. And they knew this. So, you know, I think that's why they were trying to derail it. But you know, what was interesting was even after busting them and, and catching them in the act of instilling this program in my like brain at night, it was still a difficult mindset to get myself out of for about the next week. So even though I knew this was false, you know, deliberate programming for about the next week, it was like I, I had a really hard time just not seeing everything that was wrong and ugly in the world and just being in a really kind of dark, cranky mindset where you're just focusing on how stupid everybody is and annoying and uh, just everybody's getting on your nerves and the world sucks and you only just see everything that's wrong in the world. And, you know, it was, but I kept reminding myself, like, look, this isn't your normal state. You caught them putting this programming in your head. So you need to snap out of it, you know, and I did pulled myself out of it. It took about a week though. It, it was hard. So I can only imagine just on a side note, what kind of other programs have been put into my subconscious, which ties back into everything you were saying earlier about subconscious stuff and how powerful and important that is as a component in manifestation and creating our realities. And they do know this, trust me. So they, I've, I do talk about other anecdotes in Chasing Phantoms, maybe two or three other times I caught them putting other types of programs into my subconscious. Um, but that's the one that specifically relates to our personal frequency and thus the realities we're drawing to ourselves and how I caught it, so which was good. Yeah, so earlier when I mentioned how demons, they try so hard to chip away at your positive core identity. Mm -hmm. They try to whittle you down smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's one component of it. And the other big component that they do is trying to corrupt your base worldview. So that uh, in, in, in essence, they are corrupting your feedback loop with reality. Yes. Your subconscious feedback loop with reality in order to make your reality worse and worse by your own hand, you know, being by your own subconscious being programmed by them, you know, to kind of contaminate that flow. And of course, the worse things go in your life, the more um, the more you kind of enter within their jurisdiction, you know, because they're they're trying to trip you up, they're trying to mess you up, use you for their own projects. You know, I'm, that's for my labs, right? But right. you know, demons and aliens and uh, negative, you know, dark ghosts—they mm -hmm. all got their own agendas, you know, right. and interrelated. And none of them are good. They're none of them are in our best interest, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, those ones aren't. No, not at all. It's, I mean, they're definitely hitting below the belt because. Oh, yeah. It's not like it's not like you've got an abusive coworker or a spouse or family member that you have to like consciously stand up for mm -hmm. and make yourself stronger. No, they're trying to get you when you're unconscious asleep and they're and they're like weak and vulnerable. Yeah, programming you subconsciously so that they can trip you up without you even knowing it, right. without even having the free will to catch it and resist it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's very it's a it's, it's a pretty vicious thing. Um, I mean, on, on the one hand, when you do get these negative impulses arising in you uh, in the days afterwards. I guess that's where the spiritual training can come in because as long as you know yourself and you know that those aren't your thoughts, then mm -hmm. you can counter them. But at the same time, uh, I don't think they should be doing this. I think they're, I think that's wrong. Well, what, yeah. what they're doing, obviously. Right. So, but you know, it goes to show how they do. And, and it is very, it's, it's really uh, towing the line in terms of free will violation. Right. You know, and maybe part of the thing that in me catching them in the act two or three times had to happen in order to not completely violate free will. I had to, so that I could know that this was happening to me and so that I could be mindful, you know, for the times where I don't catch it. You know, I don't, I don't know. I'm just guessing, just tossing out theories. I don't know, but I do wonder because it really does toe that line of some serious free will violation. Yeah. Now in terms of free will, if, if they, if they abduct you at night and they do their thing and they erase your memories and afterwards you don't really have any traces of it, then in terms of free will, the question is, do they really affect your life, your destiny, your, your karma, your, you know, your soul? And, and the answer is no. And I think that's why they have to do it that way. And that's why it's almost allowed. Because as long as they kind of tiptoe and they, it's kind of like visiting a national park. You know, if you don't leave, they, what, what do they say? Like, like take only pictures and leave only footprints. Yeah. That sort of a thing. If they kind of tiptoe around things and they can get away with a lot of things. But they, they cross lines here and there. And when they do cross lines, that's when you get different types of intervention whether being nudged to catch them in the act, mm -hmm. you know. And, and actually all that relates to the whole um, realm breaching subject, which is a side subject. Um, but some people listening may be thinking about this, like, that, you know, um, it starts small. Like 
maybe, you know, very under the radar and stuff. And, and, and th- this thing that I talk about where I was catching him in the act of programming me on a few occasions in Fort Lauderdale, this was during the height of just all out my lab's madness that was happening, including black helicopter harassment, overtly seeing some of thems out in public, all the stuff I talk about in my book, it was building and building it building. It didn't start out, you know, full throttle right from the start. It started small and me not putting my foot down, me not stopping it, me having fearful reactions and, and not trying to get it to stop and, and be empowered and take control, that allowed more and more and more and more. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and worse and worse and just more and more overt. It's like uh, they're forcing the, the crack open more and more and getting in. Um, and it got really close, mm-hmm. very, very close before I finally was able to put a stop to it, which I talk about in my book and I explain, which is free. Um, and I explain what I did to get it to stop. So if anyone's curious, it's all, it's all in there. I don't want to sidetrack too much, but yeah, it just, it just you know, it just reminded me of that when, when, we're, well, uh, I mean, it's important to know that these forces exist and they exist independently. You know, they're not, they're not just, uh, projections, projections of the collective shadow or, uh, projections of our own subconscious necessarily. I mean, they can be, but they're not always, mm-hmm. they got their own agenda, their own thing. But the, but the problem is they're in one sector of reality and you're in your own sector of reality. And those two, those two things, for most people, they don't really overlap too much. That's why most people don't have aliens in their lives. You know, that's why they don't have these black helicopters hovering overhead, mm-hmm. you know, scaring them. Um, but once those things start happening, it does turn into this weird feedback loop where the more that happens, the more scared you become uh, and the more you start obsessing over it. And once you become scared and obsessive o- over it, that's when it starts saturating your subconscious. Right, and that's what we're going to touch on later and when we get into the targeting thing. So yeah, so it's like a, like a little... that in depth, yeah. Yeah, it's like a little preview of that. So, yeah. I mean, just, just a, a quick gist of it mm-hmm. is that they need you to manifest them deeper into your reality to extend a drawbridge. Yeah, so they need they your frequency it. to start matching them to mm-hmm. become more of a match to pull them in because normally it's not a match. Yeah, and when we say match, it doesn't mean that you become more like a my lab handler, like, oh, you become more predatory. It's not that. It's It's more like... Predator and prey are two sides of the same coin. You know, it's like you can have the you can have two waves of the same frequency, but they're slightly out of phase, like they're opposite phase, but the same frequency. So that's like predator and prey. So they need you to match them in that sense. You know, you, they can match you in a, in a like an, like a, a polar opposite sense, and that'll also draw it in. And also part of that matching is like they go from being under the radar where you don't even know they exist to revealing themselves just slightly. And then so now you do know, and you got to get an inkling, you get that idea. Okay, they do exist. And you have a fearful response. And then that gives them more and more permission to start being like appearing more and more overtly in your reality mm-hmm. and feeding on that fear. And the fear creates a feedback loop. But that's part of it as well. It, it, to make you a match is you need to acknowledge that they exist in the first place and see them. And they see you seeing them. And now you're on each other's radars and you're giving them power. And then because you're not fighting back, you're giving them permission almost to keep going mm-hmm. and keep going and keep going. And, you know, so... Yeah, and when it comes to permission, it's not just about physical action. It's just merely about your inward uh, mindset reaction, your you know, your inner conscious orientation, like what angle it's being directed towards. If it's shining directly towards them and at them, and they are shining directly towards you with their attention, that it, that creates like a mutual entanglement, like almost like a quantum entanglement between them and you. And so no wonder then that through this entanglement, they become more and more tangible in your reality. Right. Tangible, yeah. that's the good, yeah. That's yeah, the tan- tangible and frequent. Because, you know, t- yeah. tangibility and frequency, are, well, frequency in terms of how often it happens, those are also two sides of the same coin. It can be one or the other, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big consideration. And on the more positive note, that also works the opposite way with positive forces, right? Where the more um, devoted you become, the more you think about God, the more you think about spirituality and the, the positive things in life, the more these positive entities become tangible in your life too, right? So, and, and also the more their actions become tangible. So in terms of miracles, blessings, you know, positive opportunities, um, it's just uh, more inner, inner wisdom and guidance. Their reality becomes your reality more and more and more, which shows, you know, that for humanity, humans truly are suspended between heaven and hell, so to speak, in that there's a higher realm out there above us in vibration and there's a lower realm you know, and depending on how you tune yourself through your general mindset, uh, your conscious, subconscious projections, that kind of determines which of those realms you're, you, you energize the feedback loop between, between them and you. And that's what draws it in. 
So, I mean, that is sort of the understructure of our reality, yeah. if you think about it. And there's a lot to it. Because, you know, getting back to the subject of um, specific manifesting versus general manifesting, you have to realize that specific manifesting, it's, it's very goal-oriented. You know, it's like you want this, you have to do that, and you get it later in time. So it's interesting how there's a, a component of linear time to it, like a linear time delay, how there's anticipation because, you know, you do it and now you're aware of it and you, you want it. So there's also ego involved, you know, this wanting, there's desire, mm -hmm. there's attachment. And that's what can bite people in the butt. You know, that's why, that's why for people who are, um, I don't know, like certain fundamentalist Christians or uh, certain people have a very, very high spiritual understanding they'll tell you that all this law of attraction, like manifesting rituals, that that's like black magic, that's witchcraft, like don't do it, you know, stay away from it. You know, that's a big subject in itself. Mm -hmm. But I think what they're picking up on is how it can go wrong when you intend for something specific from the wrong place within you. Okay. Because the thing that specific manifesting still has uses for, it's not all bad. Like it still has important uses. Like for example, earlier, we mentioned how their how your free will is sometimes required to allow your destiny or higher positive intervention to proceed. Like they need you to kind of open the door from the inside and you know kind of jiggle the handle from the inside and unlock it so that they can like proceed with what needs to happen but which you've been blocking. And for something like that, it requires a specific uh, free will act to do it. You know, so maybe they nudge you to intend for uh, I don't know like a, like a like a like a life of freedom for example. Or, a specific good outcome to this particular dicey situation where if it doesn't turn out good, then your life could be wrecked. So sometimes they need you to intend for something specific, and that's a that's a good example of it. Uh, or for example, um, when you're in, just, you know, you're just kind of indirectly letting the divine know what you want and what you need, and it comes from uh, it's it's a sincere expression of the heart. Because we have different impulses within us. We've got the impulses of the spirit slash soul slash heart. And then we've also got the impulses of the ego, the shadow, the id, the, the you know different negative entity attachments and negative programming that we have. And it's, so it's not like every single impulse that we have only comes from us. You know, what is us? No, it's not just us. It's like multiple things. Like it's the higher part of us. It's the lower part of us. It's like external forces, both positive and negative. And so when you differentiate between these things, I mean, it's kind of clear to me that uh, intending for something specifically, it can be good or bad depending on where that intention originally comes from, right? Because, you know, we've got multiple intentions within us, some good and some bad. So, yeah, I mean, specific manifesting isn't all bad. You know, there's definitely good uses to it. I mean, another example is, uh, let's say you're caught in a bind in life. Like, things just aren't working out for you. You've tried everything. Like, nothing's really working. Uh, and you've got negative programming as well. So you're in a pretty tough spot. I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to, I don't know, adopt a general positive attitude and just trying to hope that everything comes to you? I mean, no, you're not because you're too beaten down. You know, you too, you can't sustain a positive vibe for days and days and days in order to really turn your life around. You know, you need something to bootstrap you. And what that bootstrap is, that initial spark can be an act of specific intention, something that you can only do. Maybe you can only muster 15 minutes worth of energy to do it, right? That's different from trying to do it constantly for seven days through a general attitude. But let's say you only you can only muster five, 10, 15 minutes. And so when you do that, you're, you know, you, you marshal all your energy, all your immersive power into those five, 10, 15 minutes into manifesting, I don't know, um, wisdom, guidance, a uh, solution out of uh, some sort of uh, help out of the hole that you've, that you've, you know, been dug into. Uh, and that can then ignite the spark to get you that leg up on the situation which then gets you a little, I mean, like, a, like a breather. Enough of a breather that you can eventually then incorporate it into a more general mindset, and that's what ends up turning your life around. So sometimes, yes, you do need that, that very sharp, concentrated, high-energy, specific intention in order to kind of break through a block, kind of, kind of break through that ceiling. And so, yes, yeah, so that's another example of how specific in, uh, manifesting isn't bad in all situations across the board. But... Mm -hmm. As I said, it's quite dangerous because, uh, in a way, it is almost like an act of magic. And magic can backfire horribly. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, and it brings up the question, well, okay, then what happens if you do this positive, specific example of, man of manifesting, but your general attitude, like your general mindset is bad? Like, let's say you've got a very depressed, very defeated, you know, um, self-deprecating 
self-destructive mindset. But you figured, okay, I need to turn my life around, so let me intend for some sort of break from this. I mean, in some cases, some, in some cases, it simply doesn't work because your general mindset has too much gravity pulling you back down to the ground, right? So you're trying to do, trying to leapfrog through the different levels of, of you know, blocks, you know, beyond it through this very specific intention, but there's just too much subconscious baggage and gravity holding you down. And usually in those kinds of cases, you know, you just have to do that inner shadow work. You have to get more rest, get better nutrition, take physical action to um, plug the energy leaks and to kind of boost your energy physically, um, you know, or take what opportunities you need to uh, turn your life around, let's say financially or socially or, or whatever, whatever it is that you've got a problem with. You know, you can't really do everything just through intention. You have to take physical action as well, of course. So, you know, in those cases, when you've got this heavy baggage that is pulling you down, either it doesn't work or it contaminates the outcome of what you're specifically intending. It's like having a rotten poison cake with really good icing. <laughs> you take a bite, you get that nice yummy sugar, but then you get sick to your stomach because you know, mm. the, the cake was corrupted. So that can happen too, which is a form of backfiring, right? right? So a lot of times when people, when they try to do these these uh, law of attraction things without cleaning up their interstate, without processing their baggage and making sure that their shadow isn't like this bloated beast that's controlling all their <laughs> ego actions, then yeah, that's that's when things either don't work or they backfire or things just keep going wrong, you know, horribly. And you see a lot of times these people are also, like you were just saying, physically unhealthy, you know, you do have to get physically healthy, you know, and I see a lot of people that are just physically unhealthy in this world. It's a very unhealthy yeah. modern lifestyle that most of us are living. Bad diet, not enough sleep, too much stress, which leads to more bad diet and drinking or just things that are not good for you. So people need to get physically well too and, yeah, and I, clean house right. psychologically with their baggage and their shadow and all that. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned feedback loops over and over again because it's such an important concept, Yeah. right? Because as you said, like you get a physical problem, and that screws up, let's say, your ability to make money. So therefore, you eat less, you know, like a poorer diet. Therefore, your mind gets screwed up. So therefore, you can't hold a, a decent, balanced mindset. So now, all of a sudden, you start metaphysically attracting in negative things because now your mindset is all screwed up due to Chaotic. malnutrition. So you can get these, it's a complicated feedback loop. Yeah. And any, anywhere along that process, a person can break it, but they have to break it at the appropriate spot. So if they're within that physical part of the feedback loop, they have to break it physically through, you know, I'm just going to get better nutrition like what vitamins you know liver whatever whatever it is that gives your body what it needs um but if it's did a you say liver yeah well <laughs> yeah. i said liver because chicken liver is cheap and it's got a ton of vitamins and i know because you eat a lot of liver so it's like funny you just squeak that in liver yeah well i have to <laughs> <laughs> yeah endorsement for liver yeah well you know they did a study in world war ii they tried to figure out like what is the the most nutritious nutritious meal that you can have for the cheapest amount of money and they just, they figured it out after analyzing everything. It is cabbage and hog's liver. Wow. And what and bread, you know, or whatever sort of carb it on the side. Does not sound appetizing. No, no, it doesn't. I mean, that's like that's like old Ooh. people old people food, I like know. liver and onions and cabbage and stuff. Living through the Great Depression, you know. Yeah, yeah, but but it shows the practicality of it. You know? Yeah. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, there are solutions, no matter what problem, what kind of bind you're in. Mm -hmm. There's always a crack somewhere, some little exit that you can take if you're just smart and you look for it and you start taking action. But yeah, so people are caught in these feedback loops. And one reason I mentioned this is because if you're like in a, in a general like negative mindset and you're just generally attracting misfortune and so on, and, and then you do the specific intention to try to break out of that, that's one of the times where it's a very good idea to be specific in what you're intending and to like list out all the different requirements in order to close all the loopholes. Because as you see, the gravity of your of your dark shadow in your subconscious, the gravity of it is going to try any which way to twist it like a monkey's paw situation to backfire mm -hmm. on you. Okay. You know, or negative entities are working through your subconscious to do it. Either way. You better explain what monkey's paw is because a lot of people don't know what that is. Okay. Well, there's, there's this old story. I think it was even a movie about this, uh, this like voodoo relic consisting of like of a like a like a cut off monkey's paw like mounted. A mummified. Yeah, like a mum mummified monkey's paw mounted to a base. And I think like for every finger... That you, for every wish you make for it, one of the fingers closes. Mm -hmm. And I think like after the fifth one, like some something bad happens. So, so it's just the idea that be careful what you wish for because it can backfire. Yeah, you'll get it, but you'll get it in a twisted way where it, like you get what you wanted, but 
it's like something good gets taken away from you in order to make it happen or it just comes to you in a twisted sort of way. Yeah. And that's black magic. That's magic and black magic in general. Right. So, and that's what happens when you leave it too open-ended that you're trying to specify something and, but you leave it kind of weirdly open. I was thinking about monkey's paw earlier when you were talking, I was like, Oh yeah, I was like monkey's paw. Mm -hmm. But, um, so it's good that you mentioned it cause yeah, it's very fitting. Yeah. So like I said, if you're in that bind where you got the subconscious gravity trying to trip you up, then when you do intend something specific, you have to be very specific. You have to be very detailed to make sure you close all those loopholes. And you know, one of the typical things you can add to it is like, uh, and for the good of all concerned, you know, you just add, tack that onto mm -hmm. the end and whatever other details you want to put in there. But that's why that's important because I, not that I encourage this, but it's almost like, like, um, making a business deal with the devil Yeah. and he's got the fine print. So you've, you got to have your fine print, yeah. like, like fully figured out so that it can't exploit the loophole. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he's going to be a smart ass about it and he's going to say like, Oh, you didn't intend for this. So the ha ha, you know, now your <laughs> house is on fire or whatever, <laughs> something like that. So yeah, you got to be specific with it. And that's one of the few times where I would recommend being specific, Yeah. you know, being detailed. It's when you're at risk of having those loopholes backfire on you. But the thing is, you know, if you can, if you don't, if your subconscious isn't like, like full of toxic negative programming sewage, then, then you don't have to worry about that necessarily. In fact, in fact, if you're able to build up a subconscious positive momentum, you know, through a general positive attitude in life, and typically you only see this in people who are, they're like the, the, the self-empowerment go-getter types or uh, the very like um very spiritual christian religious types you know the ones that are like really like their their entire day is like filled with the glory of god and that sort of thing right and the people that are that are luminous mm -hmm. with this positive energy once you're in that state now you've got this magnet that's just attracting harmony beauty uh, opportunity uh, happiness and so on and it's at that point that you can you know quote unquote let go and let god because you've got this magnet, you've got this, this momentum built up and now you don't, you can just take your hands off the wheel for the most part at that point and things will just work out magically. You don't have to do any specific intention whatsoever. Although if you do, then, you know, it'll happen way faster because just like you said, um, it's like that, that cherry on top mm -hmm. of, a, of an already good and delicious cake. You know, the, the two combined is even better. You know, you already got that positive momentum and then you do a little more momentum on top of that. And of course it's going to jet jettison you in that positive direction. But if you don't do all that work... And clean out the baggage and do all that preliminary necessary stuff and including um, taking care of yourself physically healing yourself physically then if you try to just take your hand off the wheel and be like okay god you take it over <laughs> you may be derailed in a ditch yeah yeah <laughs> or you know even worse when you've got unknowingly uh, a very self-sabotaging subconscious momentum built up like maybe you're kind of a little bit crazy or a little, a little depressed or kind of wonky in terms of um, how objective you are about reality and then you think, okay, well, I don't know. Like, like maybe you've got some delusion of grandeur, grandeur, right? You think that you're you're the Messiah or I don't know, so, mm -hmm. some, something crazy like that. But you've got this low vibrational, crazy schizophrenic energy underneath yeah. that. And if you're one of those types and you take out your hands off the wheel, well, guess what's going to happen is you're, you're merely opening up the valves fully to that, to, to that sort of magnetic attraction. So what are you going to pull in? You're going to pull in reality glitches you're gonna pull in all sorts of weird things that don't work like misfortunes mm. and you know you'll probably pull in like negative entities that play to your delusion of grandeur as well you know, it, it helps reinforce it'll end up reinforcing it in this toxic feedback loop right you know so you, you get more and more crazy um but yeah if you want to if you want to take your hands off the wheel and have faith and let god work things out you definitely have to establish that that general mindset first you know once you get that flow going once the positive synchronicities or, you know, the hand of God, whatever you want to call it, starts showing itself fully and you're fully in the flow, that's when you can put it on cruise control and, and just kind of watch what happens. But the problem is you've got people out there, these, these new age teachers, spiritual Christian teachers who tell you to let go and let God have faith and so on, but they don't tell you necessarily the preconditions for making that work responsibly, right? So you got some person who's all emotional, you know, neurotic, distraught in life. They hear that message, they read a book on it, and then they try it. They figure, okay, well, my life is a mess and I don't feel too good, but if I just let go of my life and see where it goes, then God will take care of it. And I've seen it over and over again where that doesn't work. Yeah. Because 
all that happens when you take the hands off the wheel is, a, is that the car goes in whatever direction is already going. Yeah. So you have to first steer it into a positive direction and then take it off. Then you can cruise, right? right. But if it's already headed off a cliff and you take the hands off the wheel, <laughs> what's what's going to happen? You're going to go off the cliff. Right. Yeah. So that's that's something that uh, that's a popular misconception that bites a lot of people in the butt. Yeah. 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 And speaking of God and taking your hand off the wheel, that leads to the subject of religious and Christianity criticisms of manifesting. You know, there are Christians who believe that the idea of reality creation, manifestation is akin to the whole, you're your own God, you're the master of your own universe, and thus it's satanic. They believe that only God is in charge of us. And their perspective is that God is controlling my wheel, or God is my pilot, and I'm just the co-pilot, and that nothing going on in their reality is under their control at all. It's the mindset of taking one's hand off the wheel and just trusting God to drive the car, micromanaging every last aspect of their lives, like you're just saying. Many Christians also believe that any psychic or woo-woo phenomenon, which includes manifestation, is akin to demonic powers given to us by Satan. I mean, obviously, I fully believe that we do have the ability to shape our own existences and experiences and connect to and resonate and pull in timelines that are a match for our own personal frequencies. It's not even something we can control. It just is. It's the nature of consciousness and how it interfaces with this reality. I mean, we have to make decisions every day to do things in our lives. That's where the most basic of reality creating, i.e. shaping our lives in third density starts. But by the extreme religious people's logic, we shouldn't even be doing that apparently since God controls all. Manifestation is just a higher next step like next step up version of what we physically do every day in third density. So where does God's control end and our f own free will and ability to manifest begin? And that's the big question. Yeah. Even in Christianity, of course, it's known that God helps those who help themselves. That, you know, there are things that we do every single day that we have to do ourselves. But, you know, most of it's limited to the physical domain. Like, obviously, God's not going to literally drive our car. You know, it's not literally going to mow our lawns or blow our nose or digest our food, you know. Uh, you know, divinity, it, it takes care of what is beyond our control. Right. So, you know, you're on, a, you're on a highway and, I don't know, your tire blows out and you're about to crash into a median and you got someone, you got a whole like family with you and you're not meant to die. Mm -hmm. So maybe then something really weird happens. Some sort of divine intervention happens that that, you know, moves you out of the way just in, in the right mysterious way, breaking the laws of physics if necessary. Right. And that'll save you. But, you know, God's not literally going to drive your car. On the other hand, you know, we also talk about how everything is God and how we who have spirit have a God spark within us. So in a sense, we do have a, a fragment of the infinite creator within us that gives us free will and gives us sentience. And because we have free will... We have to use that to some extent. Now, I mean, abilities beyond the five senses are not necessarily in themselves witchcraft. Because after all, you know, you have dreams, for example, you can get guidance in dreams, you can get visions in dreams, and that doesn't mean that you're a witch. Right. Because it's a natural function of your consciousness. You have a subconscious, your subconscious isn't fully anchored into linear time, and so when you dream, you might get symbolic imagery pertaining to things, you know, coming up in the future. And so that's not witchcraft. We have intuition mm -hmm. and Christians would say that, okay, intuition, that is basically the Lord speaking to me. Right. And, you know, in, in a way that that is true because intuition comes from higher consciousness, whether it's our own higher consciousness or whether it's uh, positive beings, for example, that are communicating with us telepathically. Mm -hmm. And they would do so through our intuition if we're not all that psychic. Because intuition or just, you know, plain gut feeling that is like the lowest order of psychic power that you can have. And that's why it's also the most universal because it's kind of like a pyramid. You know, the base of the pyramid is the widest and that's also what the lowest uh, level of psychic power is. So we all have intuition to some extent. We all have dreams. And, you know, we also get synchronicity, of course, as we've been talking about. And some synchronicities, they're not even necessarily symbolic. They're, they're almost kind of nonsense in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. You try to read into, okay, like, I don't know, you get a... A weird synchronicity, like two words lining up, or I don't know, uh, like a like you see a weird duck crossing the road, or something like that, and it ties into some other thing you're thinking about that ties into a duck. Well, if you look up duck in a dream dictionary, it'll have a certain meaning, but it may not necessarily be relevant. 
it may simply be an improbability that will accompany another improbability that's going to be coming up within, say, 24 hours. Right. And so its only significance is that it is improbable. Not necessarily that the duck is some message from God to you <laughs> to watch whatever, you know, the symbolic meaning of duck is. Because after all, that original thing that you were thinking about, perhaps, to do with ducks, that wasn't meaningful. So therefore, when the duck, come, you know, is seen again as part of a synchronicity, it d itself doesn't have to have a symbolic meaning. Right. Right. So yeah, you know, synchronicities, manifesting as well. Oftentimes, we manifest things without even trying. We're just innocently daydreaming about something. Yeah. And it comes about. And what, are, are we doing witchcraft in that moment? No. No? No, it's, it's a natural, almost like mechanistic phenomenon which, you know, they would just call the law of attraction or some sort of quantum resonance phenomenon. So it's as natural as a law of nature, essentially. And that's not witchcraft either. So I think the consequences of this is, it, it all has to do with the fact that we have souls, that we are God sparks within us, and therefore we aren't just physical machines. So if we take that into consideration, then our powers and our abilities and our responsibilities don't end at the level of physicality. We have to be responsible for our thoughts. We have to be responsible for our feelings, our beliefs, and what we project subconsciously into this, this matrix existence. And so that responsibility includes occasionally, you know, taking control of the metaphysical side of things as well. And uh, if it, see, if, if we weren't meant to do it, I don't think we would have the ability to do it. And so ultimately, it comes down more to how we use it and where it comes from, like where our intention comes from of using it, than that thing in and of itself. So I think Christians, uh, well, the fundamentalist Christians are being a bit too absolutist, like too black and white. Yeah. And dismissing it all just because it contradicts, you know, their interpretation of dogma, but not necessarily, I mean, their view, I don't think is necessarily in accord with the logic of the metaphysics, if you really think about like how it works and where that's where it all comes from. Right. You know? And, you know, there's a level of hypocrisy there too, because if you were to pray for help, let's say you pray to God for help, and then a miracle happens, a Christian will thank God. You know, they will think that that's, that's okay, because mm -hmm. you prayed for a miracle and God answered. But if a non-Christian prays for help, let's say from um, higher forces, doesn't even use the word God, but just uses higher forces, that's not part of the Bible. That's not necessarily... Or they somehow take matters into their own hands psychically, which we'll actually be getting back into a little bit later, the idea of that. Yeah, and yeah. if they if they receive the exact same help with this exact yeah. same outcome, what, now it's witchcraft because they didn't use biblical terminology mm -hmm. and, they're man and they're manifesting? Like, I don't think so. So, I mean, clearly to me, the infinite creator and divine forces, it's bigger than religion. It's bigger than the Bible. You know, religion and Bible, th these are all just particular uh, magnifying lenses into one part of creation and they don't hold a monopoly on spirituality they don't hold a monopoly on truth they may have a lot of truth in it but that doesn't mean that truth ends where the last page of the bible ends right yeah so that's my personal view on it and so as i said you know some things are in our hands to do for our own good because we can and because we must now as I mentioned, the fact is you're already manifesting just by your default mindset. So when you have false thoughts or false feelings that are stemming from darkness or ignorance within you, those things are already shaping your life. And as I said, that's not necessarily intentional witchcraft. Although, interestingly enough, in a way it is witchcraft in that it's something dark within you manipulating you to twist your reality, mm. to cause you pain and cause pain to others. So if you want to blame anything, blame the ego and the shadow within you for misusing these forces towards dark ends. But don't blame the method. Don't blame the phenomenon. Blame right. merely the source of it, which points to the fact that we do have a goodness within us. You know, we have the, the God spark, the spirit, the heart, the soul, whatever you want to call it. And this thing is tied into the divine. You know, it's tied into the higher part of creation. And it has a wisdom to it, a spiritual intelligence to it, that knows when it's good to manifest something and knows when it's bad to do so. So, you know, it's very important to distinguish where our intentions come from. And manifesting then is bad or satanic when it's done with bad intentions, out of foolishness, out of misguided values. And it's bad when it comes from a dark place within, you know, the ego, the shadow, 
your ignorance, your vices. It's bad when it intends harm towards someone, like not for self-defense purposes, but just out of, you know, jealousy or greed or malice. Right. Um, and in those cases, it will backfire. It will lead at some point in your future to some sort of regret. Uh, and most of all, it'll fall apart if, if it simply doesn't even come true in the first place. Like if it does come true, it'll be contaminated, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, it'll backfire quite a bit. And we also have to take into consideration the fact that when you change your vibes, it affects your, your life trajectory. Okay? And when you change your mindset and your life changes, that shows that some aspects, some theme of our life is it's in our hands. You know, it's, it's in our hands. And it also shows that divine forces, you know, they can, I mean, sometimes either they can't reach us or they can't help us when we're in a very low vibrational state. Like if you have a very low mindset, on an occult level, you're surrounding yourself with like dark clouds of etheric energy. And uh, you're, you're more distant from the divine forces and you're definitely closer and closer and closer to the dark demonic forces who resonate with that energy mm. and can therefore uh, manipulate you, control you, see you, uh, predict you, control you. Know, they, have, they have more jurisdiction over you when you're resonating at their particular level, you know, with those energies. And so that's why when we raise ourselves, when we raise our mindset, when we kind of attune ourselves to God, to the infinite creator, to spirit, to these higher spiritual principles and uplift ourselves emotionally and mentally, these higher positive forces, they, they, they rejoice, you know, they work with us and they work with us hand in hand. And that is us meeting them halfway. I think that is one of the most uh, purest forms of the principle of God helping those who help themselves. You know, it's, it's not just you helping yourself physically, like, you know, okay, great. You need a new job or you need a, you just need a job period. Of course you got to submit your resume and, you know, go job hunting. It's not easy for it to happen all by itself with you doing nothing. Right. So, but that's the physical side of it. Well, what about the mental vibrational spiritual side of it? You also got to do the job of attuning yourself higher and Christians would call it, you know, meditation and prayer and, uh, getting right with God mm -hmm. and so on. But those are just words that describe a common principle, which in the new age parlance, we would just call raising your vibes. Right. But you know, you can, you can, Describe it any which way using any which language, but it's all the same thing, which is tuning your inner consciousness radio dial more towards the channel of the infinite creator. Right. So those are some important things to consider. And so therefore, I really don't think that I really don't think that manifesting in and of itself is satanic. It's all about how it's used, where the intention comes from and uh, what it ultimately fulfills in terms of spiritual agendas. Right. I guess is it fulfilling a dark demonic agenda or is it actually helping yourself and helping others. Like, for example, uh, let's say you've been programmed most of your life by, let's say you're an abductee, like a military abductee, alien abductee, and you've got demons in your life. It's a pretty bad situation, but it's actually more common than people think. Right. Let's say you've got that going on and your subconscious is, it's, it's a wreck, and your life is very difficult because you, you're tied down by so much limited, uh, you know, self-limiting programs and negative entity issues and, you know, dark energy fields. Well, who's going to solve that? They're like, who's going to get you out of it? You definitely share 50% of the burden of getting yourself out of that hole. But as long as you apply yourself and you project your intentions in the correct direction, which is towards the divine forces and within the God spark within you, and you tap into that, uh, you know, the universe, creation, God will take care of the other 50%. But you have to do that yourself. So yeah, we definitely do have responsibility over manifesting and our synchronistic flow in life yeah you know and closely related to this is the religious types who believe that all negative things going on in their lives are just quote tests from god and you hear this one a lot <laughs> the whole idea of god is testing me believing that god basically has nothing better to do than to micromanage tests to mess with billions of people and your job is to just endure so don't try to make things better by getting rid of abusers or bad situations from your sphere. Don't leave the toxic relationship or quit the bad job or move away from a bad living situation or stand up for yourself. Don't try to take control of your life or improve things in any way. Just sit there and endure whatever torments are being flung at you because it's God's test for you. 
I mean, I guess the logic is eventually you will pass the test and it will all just stop. <laughs> I don't know. I guess that's kind of what, what the idea is. But, you know, I actually, I knew somebody not all that long ago at a job I was at last year um, who just embodies this to, <laughs> to the letter. She, it was a receptionist. Her name was Lydia, and she's about 27 years old. Uh, and she was very Christian born again. And she would just desperately cling to this philosophy about God testing her. So, you know, she was clearly being bullied all the time by this chick named Jen from HR, who had for some reason been put into a supervisor position above her and was abusing that position by being like a micromanaging bully on a power trip. So it was to the, the point of qualifying as like full on harassment. It, it was it was not good. And, you know, where Lydia's complaints to Jen's boss, who was the head of HR, resulted in absolutely nothing. So HR kind of made it clear they don't have her back and you're kind of on your own in this situation and they didn't care. So, you know, um, but no matter how you know badly Lydia was treated and how much it was made clear that HR was not going to help, she wouldn't leave the job. You know, she just mentioned several times to me directly that these were just tests from God. Now, that was her words and it was her belief and that I guess she was supposed to conquer these tests. And she was acting proud, almost like like it was a badge of honor that she was enduring all this suffering according to the Lord's will or whatever and being bigger and better person for not kind of like, you know, succumbing to anger and popping her top, like somehow that made her the bigger and better person. And, and whatnot, but, you know, I was just thinking, girl, like, I really don't think that's what's happening here at all. Um, I mean, it's just, to me, she was just totally misreading the situation so that she could kind of look like the hero, martyr victim or something. And, you know, the thing, my, my mentality is you don't need to suffer and endure. You need to leave the situation. You need to get yourself out of this toxic place because it, it was a toxic job. It was, it was not good. You need to find a better place to work. And it would have been one thing if she acknowledged that and was like, yeah, I'm trying to get out of here, but I just can't find a new job. So for now I'm stuck in this situation. But that wasn't the case. No, she really believed it was tests from the Lord. And so the more she was bullied and harassed by Jen, the more she would just dig in to stubbornly endure and hopefully win in this battle ordained from God. So it was the whole thing. It was just kind of like, it's just toxic. Yeah, well... It's not like people don't get tests in life. And there are situations where there's nothing you can do about it. And so in a sense, it's more of a, a personal spiritual test. And, you know, I'm a, how much fortitude do I have to withstand something that's very difficult? Right. And that actually is almost like a fine line of trying to discern what is maybe an actual valid, um, I don't know if a test is even the right word, or a, something from your own higher self, something that you're supposed to, uh, achieve here or conquer, you know, like, like, like a test or a battle, but then where it's now just negative loose feeding, you know, and life derailment from negs and, and that sort of thing where it, this isn't a test or a big battle that you actually agreed to do before you came here. This is true. Like it's just negative, nasty interference just for the sake of it, for feeding or derailing you, you know, and, and whatnot. And it is hard. To, you know, you got to discern the difference, the fine line between what, which one is which. What are you dealing with? Yeah. And one of the key factors is how much free will you have in the situation. Because if you don't have any free will in the situation at all, like you're completely stuck. Like, let's say you're in prison for, I don't know, five years. Right. What do you, I mean, what are you going to do? Like try to bust out? You can try. <laughs> but I don't think that's necessarily the lesson. See, sometimes things just have to do with patience. But pa see, patience is one of those things that you can't really learn in a higher realm necessarily because they don't have the level of resistance that we do here yeah or the level of ignorance uh, level of linear time that we have here so patience is one of those things that builds willpower and builds uh, inner spiritual strength so sure you know there might be situations that we get put through either by our own um our own destiny you know pre-incarnational curriculum sort of thing but at the same time, yeah, that would be a better way of putting it, pre-incarnational curriculum. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, if if it's a situation where there is something to be learned, there is a choice to be made, there is something to be applied, there is a there is a weakness that you are giving into that you you know deep down that you're ignoring it. It's like you you're kind of putting that aside and you just want to 
revel in the ego shadow ident- identification with the suffering, mm-hmm. then that's when it becomes, um, that's when the ends become the means in a way you kind of put the horse before the cart. It, it, it becomes backwards and that's when you start spinning your wheels over and over and over again. And life will reinforce that by sending you the same situation over and over without any new novelty, without any changes whatsoever. Uh, and you can, you can get out of it if you want. The choice is there. You can do it, but you choose not to. You choose to stay in it. And that is sort of the, uh, that's the way that the negative forces can get around the issue of free will. If they can convince you into continually choosing to uh, be stuck in a rut and go in a cycle over and over again, suffering and suffering and suffering under the misguided illusion that maybe this is part of your destiny or you're, sp- you're supposed to, or like in the new age field where they say that um, don't interfere with a predator who's abusing you because that is his or her nature. And you don't want to violate their free will by denying them what is in their nature to do. I mean, how backwards is that, right? That's a that's a total misconception right there. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was that reminds me that you know the way that New Agers also have that version of this same misunderstanding that you know substitute God is testing me with. It's a learning lesson. <laughs> So I actually had a, um, an art, it's an article on my website called new age, love and light fallacies. I think I, I did reference this earlier, a good quote from that, which really pertains to this, um, was where I said, many new agers get everything backwards and upside down, including this. They think that so long as negative stuff is happening to a person, then quote, it must be happening for a reason end quote. So just sit there and suffer with it for as long as it goes on, because the suffering itself must be quote, the lesson. And I wrote, no, the lesson is to realize, hey, something in my personal frequency slash field is pulling these sorts of awful people and situations into my reality. I need to look into that and figure out how this happened so I can change things. That's the lesson. Yeah, and that's very indicative of how you can have truths that are distorted into half-truths, and it, and it just w- works the opposite of what the people intend. Because for sure, there are learning lessons in life, Definitely. There's many things you can learn, there's many ways you can grow, but to misapply that principle into this, this new age backwards way where you put up with redundant suffering for much longer than necessary because you think that the suffering in itself is a lesson, no, not necessarily. Not when you have free will, not when you are refusing to acknowledge certain things that if you were to acknowledge them, if you were to step into the power that's needed to utilize them, you would get out of that situation. And if you did do that, you would find that life shifts that oftentimes you don't get those challenges anymore because you've graduated that particular uh, learning lesson. Right. Yeah. Like if you don't learn this lesson, you're just, it's just going to kind of keep happening to you in life. I've experienced this before with like bully harangers at jobs, for instance, that seemed to be the most common place where I've encountered it because I've worked my entire life, basically (laughs) had a lot of jobs. So I'm just constantly, you know, interacting with a wide variety of people, coworkers and bosses and, you know, even the pub, you know, the public and stuff. And yeah, in certain situations would keep repeating themselves until I learned how to stand up for myself. And I know we did touch on that earlier, but it is a really important concept to be, you know, that needs to be reiterated. And it's a huge subject in itself, really, about how so many people, maybe even most people that I've crossed paths with out in the world, they, they don't seem to believe in the idea of walking away from bad situations and people. I don't know what's going on with this. If it's just personal fear-based weakness, low self-esteem, some sort of natural or artificially induced apathy and passivity or what, I don't know. But over and over, I see how most people won't leave bad jobs. They won't end bad romantic relationships. They won't cut out toxic friends or family members. They make excuses for themselves or the abusers. Or if they do leave, they keep going back. They keep these people around and keep funneling all their energy, time, resources into what basically amounts to a black hole. That's how I always describe it. It's like just a black hole and they're funneling everything into it. Sometimes it's under the misguided notion that these abusers can be redeemed. They just need patience and for somebody to believe in them and or they believe the job situation will eventually just sort itself out or they just need to hang in there using whatever excuse works to help with that. And Lydia, for instance, was, you know, had her specific religious related crutch that she used so it's just a world of predators and feeders paired up with prey and energy suppliers but where the majority of the prey never wake up and see reality for what it is or they're too fearful to face reality for what it is and and i've just seen this so many times over the years 
everywhere I go. Yeah, and it can go on for decades in the yeah. case of spouses or toxic family members. Uh, yes, and that's what I was thinking. Yes, as I was talking about this, I'm like, yes, and I'm thinking about these horrible marriages that go on for decades, and and especially things with family members where a lot of people feel like, oh, it's family. You kind of have no choice but to be tethered to them, and then that's going to go on sometimes for decades because it's family. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, and in those situations, it does have to do with fear of the unknown. Like, if I were to leave this person, how am I going to provide for myself? Uh, you know, the, the uncertainty of trying to make it after leaving a familiar situation. So you got fear. And in the case of family members, uh, I mean, as you said, that's obligation. Yeah. An obligation, I mean, if you think about it, what is that really? That is, if you feel obligated towards someone you don't even love because you don't truly love or truly like. I mean, if you were to meet them in the street and then let's say they were just friends, mm -hmm. if you just hate their guts because they're assholes, like why should you then love them just because they're your brother or your sister? Right. And you know that phrase like blood isn't what makes family. You know, there's mm -hmm. other ties and emotional connections that can create a sense of family. That's nothing to do with genetics and blood, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, our true family is our spiritual family, yeah. people that we truly identify with and were family with prior to this life. So, but you know, one of the, one of the key things that some people don't realize is that there's more than one way to learn a lesson. See, because what a lot of people default to is learning a lesson after the fact, uh, in a reactive way. So let's say that they keep a very abusive person in their life for one decade, two decades, three decades, and eventually they get so sick, so burned out, they just can't do it anymore. And maybe at that point, then it snaps. And they leave. But they could have left, you know, half that time sooner if they had just drawn that line in the sand sooner. But yeah. but they let themselves be pushed by life because they weren't being proactive. They weren't learning before the fact. So there are so many different types of challenges in life that it's like, you know, it's like we have a choice. And therefore, not every challenge that we face is necessarily fated. Unless there's simply no other way for you to learn. Like if you have no free will in the matter then fine, you can consider that fate because it doesn't matter either way because you're stuck in the situation and you just got to deal with it now. So just, you know, make the best of it. Uh, try to approach it from a higher spiritual perspective and be strong getting through it. You know, practice your patience, practice your discernment, practice your, your fortitude and overcoming your fear. But the problem is that um, it's, it's in thinking that since everything is a lesson, as you said, Chris, uh, that you just have to suffer through whatever happens. Mm-hmm. And that's not necessarily the case because you can learn proactively and you can preempt a lot of the suffering that comes in life. And you'll find that if you simply uh, apply yourself, think ahead and consult your intuition and your logic and your experience, you know, maybe consult a trusted friend if you need to. And if you take decisions based on that, you'll notice uh, things happening so much faster and better in your life mm -hmm. versus being completely passive and just waiting for life to come at you. Right. Which is the same thing as taking your hands off the wheel, which I mentioned earlier, it all comes down to what direction your car is pointing when you take your hands off. Yeah. You know, you have to steer it first before you take your hands off. And a lot of people simply aren't doing that because they, um, they're operating under misguided assumptions that either there is no such thing as God, there's no such thing as spirituality and metaphysics. And so therefore anything goes, um, you know, they adopt this non nihilistic viewpoint that life has no inherent meaning. Um, and so they, they merely operate on a mechanical level, which is life only has the meaning that I give it. And it's only as good as I make it, but only as good as I make it physically, through mm -hmm. physical action. And that then justifies uh, having no empathy and basically steamrolling over people to get what's yours. To try to grab success from the air without consideration of the bigger metaphysical picture. You know, so that's one fallacy. And then you got the opposite fallacy, both in the New Age and in certain Christian mentalities of taking your hands off wheel completely without first uh, getting yourself into the flow and getting yourself right with the universe and getting the, the, the harmonization with the greater creation uh, going. You know, even so, um, the experience of being human and exercising observation and discernment with limited information in order to preempt suffering, that in itself is a part of the growing process. Ultimately, what it comes down to is a life essentially just gives you what you're willing to tolerate. And so, therefore, suffering tends to continue until you've had enough. Yeah. I mean, like I said before, I've definitely, definitely experienced that where 
until I learned how to stand up for myself and push back and say no, or, you know, these things just kept, ha- it just kept happening. You know, it's, I, I call it like the matrix. It's just this push, push, push thing where it's just going to keep trying to push you until you finally push back and say no or stand up for yourself. Yeah. And the reason that is, in my opinion, is because we are being, we are growing this God spark that is us. And how do you grow the God spark? Well, you do it in at least two ways. The first way is to be more of what it is, which is to be good, be creative, be uh, sentient, you know, have foresight, have discernment, have wisdom. Those things, those are all like positive attributes, right? But also, it has to do with being able to withstand the dark, to be able to hold your light when you're surrounded by darkness. And that then has to do with standing up for yourself, making choices, making tough choices, um, being firm. Like, if, you, if you're going to love someone else, you can love them through kindness, if they respect kindness, or you can love them through tough love, firm action, if that's the only thing that they respect. And uh, so... So much of this, you realize, comes down to discerning between similar things or or not having a simple binary mindset, you know? Like, a a simple binary mindset would be uh, you either love someone and therefore do everything that they tell you to do and never make them upset, or you don't love them at all, and therefore you're a bad person for not loving, for not being a loving person. No, that's not true. You can love them, but there's different modes of love, right? Kind love, tough love all those different things, and you have, to, you have to love according to the person. And so the issue is that when you don't recognize these subtle differences and you don't apply these, these principles, uh, you wind up with redundant types of suffering. And that's what negs want. Mm. You know, negs want redundancy. They want suffering without a point. They want suffering over and over and over again without you necessarily growing. Right. Uh, with you actually perhaps growing weaker because... Every time you repeat a lesson, it costs something in terms of time, in terms of your emotional well-being, your spiritual well-being, uh, just your energy levels, you know, the integrity of your psyche. Those things get cracked more and more and more, uh, more and more that a lesson repeats. Yeah, you get ground down. Totally. Yeah, you're yeah. actually losing your fight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's a losing investment because yeah. each time you're investing something, but the negs are taking the profit. Yeah. So what's happening, right? And that's why being proactive, learning preemptively is, uh, I think that's the best way to go. Because uh, you can only, you only have so many years to learn reactively and reactive learning is very slow. You know, it's like you're, it's like you're a donkey being trained with a whip. It's just, it's just, you don't, you don't want life to, to continually whip you. You want to be the smart person that looks ahead and navigates like a sailor. You see that whip coming. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So. You know, if you if you tolerate suffering, thinking that the lesson is is meekness and tolerance, like if you stay in your comfort zone and avoid standing up for yourself, then you're not getting it, and it'll keep repeating. Yeah. And that's what feeds the the loosh farm that we have going on on Earth. You know. So yeah, I mean, when you're doing that, you're not you're not really being true to your true self, and while being nice to others you're actually being mean and neglectful to yourself, which is just as much a violation of free will, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, what's the point of violating your own free will for the sake of another person just to make sure that they don't feel bad or that they don't think less of you? Especially if that person is a psychopath or someone who actually doesn't deserve your esteem. In my view, I think think that the purpose of evil is to be resisted and defeated. You know, it's like, it's like gym weights for the spirit, for the, for the spirit. Like you go into a gym, you got these weights and it's resistance that you push against and that's how you grow stronger. But it only works if you actually use them as resistance. So you could say that evil has a purpose to make us stronger, right? But then the new age fallacy would be, okay, well, if it has a purpose in creation, then we shouldn't get rid of it. We shouldn't fight it because it's part of creation. But that's a fallacy because its very purpose is to be fought, is to be resisted. And in doing so, the light becomes stronger. And uh, actually, I mean, if you really want to serve the darkness, then you should fight them because that's how they get stronger too. That's how they sharpen their skills. So no matter which way you look at it, the only logical thing to do is to fight darkness wherever it exists, within yourself, within others, within the world, you know, within the cosmos. And the thing is, darkness, as long as the matrix exists, darkness will always exist. It's always going to come into being because it's a product of free will. It's a product of, product of beings choosing illusion 
over truth in a way. You know, it's, it's them choosing to exploit other beings for themselves uh, instead of respecting the, the greater good you know, of themselves and others. So there's always going to be a supply of evil. And so therefore, you're not really um, going against creation by fighting it. You're merely uh, exhausting it, uh, using it like charcoal to, to light uh, a barbecue for the soul, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, we, yeah, we definitely got to resist evil and you have to learn your lessons preemptively. And that's how you avoid this stupid, redundant, uh, louche farm of suffering that we have going on here on Earth. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, you know, earlier you said that point, um, negs want redundancy, suffering without point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so, I guess, obvious, but it's so true. And I, you know, just what that reminds me of, just like a random side note, like on my website, I've got this article uh, called Workplace Conspiracies. And there's a section in that article called The Mask Falls Away When Woo Stuff Overtly Reveals Itself As You Pull the Plug. And I talk about how, and this is a phenomenon I've directly witnessed in life more than once, more than twice, just definitely it's something that is a legit phenomenon I've experienced multiple times. But when we pull the plug and remove ourselves from some abusive, toxic, loose milking endeavor, you may witness them, you know, the negs, I just, the, the thems <laughs> revealing themselves through the various, quote, people surrounding you in life. So that's where I talk about like the mask may fall away. You know, they go from smiling and seeming like a pleasant person all of a sudden within like two seconds, they get visibly angry to hear that you're quitting or leaving, even when it doesn't negatively impact them personally and when they should actually be happy for you. So that's the dead giveaway when it like literally does not impact them. They should actually be happy for you because they're maybe they're supposed to be some sort of a, a work friend that you thought was a work friend. And then the second that, you know, they hear you're pulling the plug and you're leaving they go from smiling to like angry face, like, or someone that you've never seen get angry, no matter what terrible things were happening, like way worse things than you quitting. And all of a sudden you quitting is what initiates like the, the flash in the eyes and the face getting really dark and the anger, the first time ever, like an actual anger response. Why? Well, it's cause you're pulling the plug and you know, you're leaving this pointless, like, you know, suffering without any point type of job where all you're doing is giving up your loose, you know, your energy, your time into this black hole. And, and it's just interesting. It's almost like you see the matrix at work through these people. Like it just comes through suddenly. And then again, that leads to the big question, which again, we'll be getting back to at the end. What is this place really? When those types of things happen, when someone who seems like a totally normal, nice person, you would never suspect of being something fake or matrixy, you know, suddenly it's almost like a glitch and, and the matrix suddenly through them, almost like an Agent Smith type of thing coming through them. You know, like what the heck's going on with that? So, I mean, we'll be getting back to that later. But, you know, I, I just I find that interesting because I've, I've witnessed it. What happens when I'm like, yeah, I'm not tolerating this pointless suffering anymore. You know, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm out of here. I'm pulling the plug. And then they, they get visibly angry you know, coming through random people. I, I don't get it. I don't know. Just... Yeah, well, there's some pretty weird, uh, complex, twisted psychology going on there, too. Because in some cases, it is directly a negative entity working through them mm -hmm. and kind of kind of uh, shooting you an evil glare. Uh, it's, it's almost like, like you're slipping out of their grasp, their little playground. Sometimes it's been more than just an evil glare. That's what I mean. It's yeah. just like, what is happening here? Yeah. Now, in some cases, I think it could also be people who themselves are stuck in a bad situation. No, and they, yeah. And, and they of course, it. a lot of people's first thought would be that. But I can assure you, like, that wasn't what was happening. No, no. But no, what, what I mean, though, is that these people themselves are, they're also under the control of negative entities. And the negative entities have convinced them subconsciously to... Um, revel in their own suffering mm. uh, and it's almost like a masochistic kind of way yeah and uh you know that their heart has probably been hardened you know, it's grown cold and they hate themselves for being in this stupid situation but in some way they they get they get some sort of ego satisfaction out of suffering it too so the, in, in a way they've been mind controlled by some of these entities mm -hmm. to keep them in this loose farm and so now they've got this crab mentality that if someone else wants to get out of there they themselves it's a combination of the entity being upset that you're leaving and also this person being upset that, um, you know, you're not, you're not suffering like they are. Like you're not, you're not dark like they are. Yeah. So they, they want to pull you back in. And it's, so you kind of get the hate from both angles, from both mm -hmm. sides and then both their human side, which has been corrupted and mind controlled and the entity 
working through them, uh, upset that you're slipping away. Mm, good point. All right. So one thing I wanted to really cover just to make sure that we're all clear on it is when is reality creation okay? You know, when is it fine to do it? Because we talked about all the caveats and all the criticisms of it, but like, when is it actually okay to do it? Well, one of the main ways that it's okay is when it concerns something like, say, uh, the outcome of a road trip or a project where the outcome is open, you know, the pathway is open. It can go any number of ways and it's in your hands. It's up to you how it goes. So, because, he, because if you don't do any intention or prayer whatsoever, then in a way, this trip is, you know, it could be gauged by the law of chance. Like, if there's, a t- if there's like a nail in the road, you might get a flat tire. If uh, there's an accident up ahead, you'll get blocked. Whatever. These things could or they could not happen, and it's almost like a roll of the dice. If there's no synchronistic or manif- manifesting influence being exerted on it, then it's purely up to physicality, right? So... When it's open like that, then that's also a pretty good opportunity to try to influence it in a positive direction. Now, you can influence it either through, let's say, praying to God, if you're religious, or intending it yourself through some sort of immersion and visualization and just intending that it goes okay. But then the question is, what's the difference then between praying to God versus doing an intention? And that's a good question, because... When you do an intention, you're kind of taking it into your own hands, whereas when you're praying to a higher deity, you're merely making a request. Now, when you do make a request, let's say through prayer, what's interesting is that if you do it in a half-hearted way, like you're merely saying the words without really meaning it or, you know, feeling it deep down, then most of the time nothing happens, like your prayer doesn't get answered, which is interesting, because you would think that if... The higher deity knows your heart and knows what you need, then you just have to just barely even voice the words. Or maybe not even say it out loud, but just think it in your head, and it would know it, and then it would help you out. But in reality, from what I've seen, including with a lot of Christians that I know, that isn't necessarily the case. And the Christians themselves will tell you that if you're going to pray, you have to have faith. You know, you have to have earnestness. And in a way, you also have to, you have to have gratitude and joy for the Creator, and that kind of that, that makes the prayer sincere, you know, that, that, that's what gives it a connection to, to the Creator. But things like faith, earnestness, and gratitude, those things, how is that any different from the spiritual people saying, uh, when you manifest, you got to make sure that you don't have too much doubt, that, you know, you have to have immersion, that you have to have the energy of gratitude and joy. See, those things are identical to that. It's just using different terminology. So whether you're intending or whether you're praying to God. Either way, you're kind of doing the same thing. You have to tap into the same level of inner sincerity, uh, the inner uh, vibe, emotional mindset change. You know, that, that sort of energy, you have to tap into that in order for that to work. And so, yeah, so whether, whether it's, uh, like I said, a road trip or a project or some new job coming up, or even just your day, you know, maybe you're doing this in the morning before your day even starts, you know, just the way you want your day to go, um, you can do a protective intention for it, or you can pray for it, but as, as long as you're um, immersed in it and you've got emotional energy behind it, that's what ultimately makes it happen. So it's okay to do it that way. Another way it's okay is when you need to stake your free will in order to close any potential loopholes or exploits. So that's like, um, that's like if you do have some big opportunity coming up and dark forces are trying to trip you up and... Uh, you know, sometimes you do have to to put up barriers and make sure that it doesn't go in a negative direction. Because if you don't do it, then it's open, so therefore they can do it. You know, so sometimes sometimes you just got to put that free will flag up and say like, no trespassing. You know, this this is the way I needed to go for the good of all, and you no longer have the open avenue to get in. You know, due to me not doing any intentions what's or prayers whatsoever. So I think you have you have a pretty good example of that, don't you? Um, yeah, I mean, I have an example. Well, it, it relates to countering negative entity or, you know, hyperdimensional interference, which kind of really closely relates because it's a, a situation where, you know, you can, again, like you were just saying, pray to higher stuff, but you can also, uh, you know, take charge on your end as well and exert your free will to take charge of the situation. Um, where you're not just completely just praying to something higher and leaving it in their hands. 
And um, I mean, one of the best examples, I actually talked about this on my website in my article called Interference. Um, it was an anecdote relating to a radio show interview I was going to be doing in uh, May of 2014. So it was nine years ago now. And it was on In Other News Radio. Uh, the host of that show was Jeff. So I, I talk about this on my website, how like there was so much interference leading up to this show, like in the entire week leading up to the show for both me and Jeff. But like on my end, I was just getting like all week nonstop ear tone, synchronicities, the ne the negative numbers, even a deja vu, which is not common. I talk about on my website that phenomenon, but it's actually not something I really experience all that often. And when I do, it's always when there seems to be like a timeline fluctuation event happening where a timeline is kind of in flux. It could go one way or another. There might even be interference trying to get a time, a different timeline to happen. So I had one of those as well. Um, but the ear tones in particular, like any time I'd be emailing with Jeff about our show notes, I, I'd get like loud ear tones, like, you know, the monitoring, something's listening in on that. Um, there was like negative interference at my job that week to try to cause disruption, like literally try to get me to like quit, which would cause a lot of disruption in my personal life. Um, that was in the days before the interview. And then three nights before the interview, this is a big one. I had like a neg entity attack attempt. I say attempt because it came after me, but I kind of, you know, fought it off and got it off me. So, and I remember, you know, in the morning when I was getting ready for work, I was like kind of tuning into myself to see if I could feel like, do I seem to feel a negative presence or energy on me? And I didn't. So I was like, okay, well, I think it worked. I, you know, got it off me and I did. I mean, I felt good. So, but it was a close call because it, it tried to get on me and glom onto me, which is what they do. What, during sleep? Yes. So it was kind of like in that lower astral sort of um, state, I became aware. And, and this thing just kind of, I don't remember all the details of it. I just have this vague image in my head. I could see this thing in front of my field of view, like a black form, like coming down on me, kind of like screeching. This is a really creepy thing that was trying to get onto me. And I was like fighting it off and I got it off. Um, so it was really weird. And then, so then the day the interview arrives, it was the weekend, I think it was Saturday. And I was planning to do the interview using, at that point, I had uh, the free internet-based Google phone. I don't know if you remember, we used to mm. do that. It just requires um, the internet and a microphone and speakers or a headphone. So that's all you need to do it. But then less than like two hours before the interview was due to start at 2 p.m., the, the internet conked out at noon. And that was rare. I mean, we hadn't had an internet outage for months. And all of a sudden, the day of the interview, two hours before, the internet conks out. Um, and you had called Comcast, and you, and you said that they acknowledged this local outage and said it wasn't going to be fixed until at least 9 p.m. Well, my interview is at 2, so yeah, that's not going to that's not gonna work. <laughs> um, so I called Jeff on his cell phone, you know, using my cell phone, um, and started talking to him about what was happening. Like, oh, my God, you know just lost the internet connection, blah, blah, blah. And then he started telling me about what was going on in his end. So that's when I learned it wasn't just to me that this was happening. So on his end, he was getting tons of ear clickings. It almost sounded like Morse code clickings. Like you've had that before as well, I know. Um, so he was getting all of that in, in just clickings in his ear. Um, three days before the interview, on the same time I had had my neg entity attack attempt, he was suddenly hit with this like complete loss of enthusiasm to even do this interview. Like when this interview was his idea, like he invited me on his show. Um, he was fully enthusiastic about it for, uh, you know, it was a subject that he picked for us to talk about that interested him and what he thought would be interesting for his, his listeners. So, you know, this is a guy who went in with a hundred percent enthusiasm. Um, and then all of a sudden three days before just he said it was malaise, like it just, he was overcome with this malaise, um, total, no more interest, no more enthusiasm. And not only that, but he also had what I would call brain scramble, where he even said that he felt like, quote, I can't wrap my head around these subjects. Like he just he couldn't even think straight, like it hurt to think. And it was just like brain confusion, brain fog. So he was being attacked on multiple levels his energy, enthusiasm, his even his ability to think. He had all these clickings happening in his ear. 
Meanwhile, my internet's going out. I'd had stuff going on all week, and Negentity tried to attack me. But you know, meanwhile, despite all of that, you know, even hearing his his you know side of things and what was happening to him, like I never got stressed. I didn't get fearful. I wasn't anxious. I wasn't angry. Like nothing. In fact, if anything, it was kind of weird because I immediately recognized what was happening. I'm like, obviously, you know, negativity stuff is totally attacking and interfering with this. So it actually made me feel kind of giddy. Like it was kind of like he, 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 because like I knew like they're trying to get me. And the more that they think they're going to get me, the more I'm going to like get around it. Like I will slip out of this, slip out of their grip. You know what I mean? Like they, they don't get to get me. So it was almost like a giddy thing that happened. So it was the opposite of what might happen with most people who get full of fear, stress, anxiety, even anger. You know, I didn't have any of that. It was, it was, and I really think that was the start of making a difference in the outcome of this was my complete lack of any of those negative emotions. And instead feeling like this was kind of almost funny and like, I am totally going to conquer this. Like, sorry guys. <laughs> So, you know, I got off the phone with him and like I took a shower because I, you know, showers like, like clear your etheric body, I guess it's a weird thing, the water, the flow of water. So it's just kind of rinse your body, clear out your etheric, whatever. So you get clean. Then I lay down on the bed and I just proceeded to take charge of the situation. And again, this is on my website in the article interference at the very end. It's an add on. So if people want more details, you can get a more expanded version of this story. But I, I basically, I just laid down and I just started taking charge of this situation um, to remove these negs like out of my reality. Did a lot of visualization relating to that um, and, and basically talking to them, even though I couldn't see them in my mind's eye, but I'm addressing them because I know they're around, you know, and basically I was like, this is my interview and you're not allowed to be here. You have no power. So I was just full of just total empowerment, like, staking claim, you know, that this is my interview. This is my reality. And you're not allowed in. Sorry, you got to. And I was like, sorry, you got to go. And I envisioned pushing them out, like through a window and closing the window and closing the, the, the shades, you know, like you're out of here, close the door, lock it. Um, and it also what I did, it, it, this pushing back that I did, it, it involved me also remotely plugging into Jeff psychically, um, to remove whatever had been done to him. Cause clearly he needed help. Like I can do everything on my end to get the internet back and get stuff to leave me alone. But the internet, the, the interview isn't going to happen so long as he can't put a thought together and has no enthusiasm. So I had to do that too. And it was something I didn't even know I could do. And I'd never done it before with anybody, but not until I needed to do it, did I suddenly knew that I could do it. And so I did that, like I like psychically just like reached out to him to clear off like whatever was on him and, you know, whatever had been done to him. Um, and then I finished the the whole thing by like kind of calling on higher positive powers, uh, asking, you know, if you'd like to be able to assist, that would be awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I did do both. I, I covered both. You know, I did at the end ask for higher positive assistance, but I also put my foot down and, and said no to these entities. And this is my reality and my interview. You got to get out, scram, and, and did everything I could on my end to push them out. Um, and then so then 2 p.m. 2 p.m. comes time for the interview. The Internet has still not come back on yet. So we tried to do this through our cell phones. And he was going to try to record the audio through the cell, but it was just, it was crappy. It wasn't, it was not doable. So after like 10 minutes of trying to make it work through the cell phones, he finally was like, yeah, we're going to need to cancel and reschedule this for another day. And meanwhile, you know, I'm still not stressed, worried, angry, anxious, nothing, no negative. It, but I was thinking, and, and this was the quote, like, this is not opportune. This needs to be done today. Like, because I was completely raring to go, full energy, my mind was clear, like, totally ready to talk about all the subjects in this interview. Like, it needs to be done today. Today's the day I'm ready. Um, it needs to happen today. And as soon as I had that really intense thought, like, it has to happen today, you know, boom, internet came back on. And so me and Jeff were about to hang up after I was having this thought. And then you were gesturing to me like, wait, it, it came back on. And then you, I don't know if you remember, hmm, you started yeah. running around getting us set up with like a real microphone, not, you know, the microphone, the whatever is instead of the cell phone and um, back to the, the Google phone thing. And, and then we were able to do the interview. And then the interview was like, 
it, it was originally intended to be like a one hour show, but we were on such a roll that it ended up going for two hours and just, and, and instead of being on just Jeff's show, it ended up getting rebroadcast, which I did not know this was going to happen on dark matter radio, which is a really big deal. And it's kind of like, I'm glad I didn't know ahead of time that that was going to happen or I would have been really self-conscious, <laughs> but because I didn't know, like I did a really super job, you know, it ended up being two hours and suddenly it made a lot more sense why we'd had so much interference because what was intended is just a small one hour show on just Jeff's show ended up being two hours rebroadcast on a major woo woo show that was going to get a wide audience. So it made a lot more sense, you know, why they just came at us like full attack mode but you know the point of that story is i pushed back i also called on higher powers i covered all bases and it worked so and, and that wasn't the only time one another one of those interferences happened again years later this was in 2020 i was doing an interview um with a couple of people um a guy named patrick and um dr nozawa and it was all about negs and um it wasn't anything dramatic like what happened with me and jeff but there was definitely this interference. And the day of that interview, I knew it when I was getting ready in the bathroom in the morning. I already felt something was going to happen to try to make the interview get canceled and rescheduled. I could feel it loud and clear. And sure enough, like uh, later that afternoon, I get a message from Patrick a um, couple hours before the interview is supposed to start letting me know like, oh, no, we're going to have to cancel and reschedule because, you know, I was fine earlier. But then I went out to the store to run some errands. And when I came back, I, I've suddenly, I've got, it's almost like a sinus or a hay fever reaction. So he was having sneezing fits, just uncontrollable sneezing fits. And his nose was running and his eyes were watering. And it was just this crazy situation. And he couldn't get it to stop. And he was just like, there's no way I can do an interview in this state. And I was just rolling my eyes, you know, <laughs> like, uh, okay, here we go again. And I was just like, you know, on a side note, I'm like, you know, when you know you're going to be doing an interview, don't even leave the house that day. <laughs> just stay home, barricade yourself inside. Do not risk it. Like I, when I know I'm going to be doing an interview, I don't go anywhere. I just stay locked up inside the apartment. I'm not even kidding. I don't risk it. I don't go run errands or drive my car anywhere because you just don't know what could happen. And I'm, so I, anyway, I didn't tell him what I was going to do. I just was like rolling my eyes when I'm reading this, like, OK, fine. So I, <laughs> I don't know if you remember, I told you, all right, I want to go take care of this. Right. And I went into the, the bedroom and laid down on the bed and closed my eyes and proceeded to do the same type of situation that I did with the Jeff situation. Um, you know, staking claim. This is my interview. You cannot be interfering. And then I did the same thing, reached out psychically to Patrick to clear off whatever was being done to him to, to do this, you know, to make him sneeze uncontrollably and whatnot. And I just went on for like 10 straight minutes. I just kept going and going with it. And I suddenly could feel, okay, you're done. That's enough. Like, you don't need to keep going. It's, it's good. You're done. And so I was like, all right. So I got up from the bed and within five minutes, again, my phone ding, it was a message from Patrick, like, Oh my God, like it all suddenly just stopped. <laughs> I, we're, I'm fine now. Like we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed and I read the message. I'm like, yep, because I just did that. So like there was no doubt in my head, like, yeah, you made that happen, you know. And and um, yeah, so we ended up having the interview and it was two and a half hours. It was very successful. I mean, no other interference. And I only told him about what I had done after it was all over. I was like, oh, yeah, by the way, <laughs> once we were done recording and we were just chatting afterwards, I let him know what I had done remotely to, you know, fix that situation but yeah so those are like a couple examples of where sure you could just like call on higher power stuff um let something else take control of the wheel or you can do both it doesn't have to be either or you take control as much as you can but you can also call on higher assistance cover all bases um but it is it's like the question is do i believe like if i hadn't asked for the higher assistance would it have still worked i actually think probably yes I think it was more about me staking my claim and learning how to do something like this and that you can do this. You can push back against these forces when they're trying to, you know, interfere in your reality. Mm -hmm. Even with the bigger type of interference, you can do this. We have this ability. And, you know, I've done it now at least twice. Oh, yeah. And forgot to mention, this is almost like the most important part of all because it really verifies um, some things or 
you know, proves what I'm talking about here. But after um, I did my big thing to get this stuff out of my reality and to help clear Jeff and what was happening to him, not only did the internet come back on, but Jeff even confirmed that on his end, all of a sudden, all his problems lifted like immediately. So the, the malaise and the, that lack of enthusiasm was completely gone. So he was back to his normal enthusiasm and energy for the interview and the brain fog lifted. So he went from like, you know, I can't even hold a thought anymore about anything relating to this to being completely clear headed. So that was the other big reason why the interview was able to go off without a hitch. You know, it did hinge on him being able to think clearly and have the enthusiasm for it, which is why it ended up going for like two hours because he was just beyond like just super duper level. So it, we were just on a roll. We were doing so good um, with our energy and our enthusiasm for it. So, it, you know, it really kind of proves that it worked what I did. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, the very fact that you can defeat neg interference that way, it kind of shows that it was in your power all along. Right. right? And which shows probably why the interference was allowed in the first place, since it was in your hands. Right. Because what I noticed for the most part is that divine intervention, when it acts on its own without even you requesting it, the divine intervention happens for most things that are beyond your power to handle. Right. right. Like it's just like some, I call it the free will violation of like epic proportions, like which I've experienced attempts at like massive car accidents that would have killed me. And I literally watched divine intervention happen right before my eyes to undo that and fix that situation. That was more than once by the way, in different states, it's pretty crazy. Like when it wasn't even my fault, I, I, one of those cases, I wasn't even driving the car. My brother was in another instance, I was driving, but, um, and I had a green light and, but a, a cop pulled out a, a right on red in, in front of me as I mean, the line of cars were all like barreling down the roadway at 60 miles an hour. So there wasn't enough time for me to stop, you know, cause he just slowly pulled out and I just watched as literally all of us cars, there was three rows of cars. It was like time slowed down. It was like a time warping field happened. And I watched, it was like, like everything just got slow and held back as he, giving him enough time to pull out and get far enough up the road that then t the time warping thing was like lifted and we were resuming back to normal speed so that now I wasn't going to hit him. Things like that, you know, and other types of interference where it's like, it's completely out of my hands. It's a free will violation. That's not my fault, you know, and it's not my time to die apparently. So like some sort of intervention, whatever the source happens, you know, to, to undo that. But then there's those situations where, yeah, you're definitely able to take some control, you know, and I almost feel like they want you to do that. Mm -hmm. They want you to get some spiritual muscle, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Like learn how to start taking care of yourself as much as you can, instead of being a baby that's always being taken care of. And a lot of people have this um, mistaken idea that we're all supposed to just be helpless babies and angels and God and everything. And I think I said this way at the very beginning, they have this childish idea that these higher stuff are supposed to just be constantly taking care of us at every turn and coddling us and being a constant safety net and that nothing bad is ever supposed to happen to us and they're supposed to protect us from all bad things at all times. And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. That's not what their job is and that's not what this place is, you know? Bad things are going to happen and you're, you're going to need to learn how to start being an adult, basically a spiritual adult and, and taking more control. Yeah, I mean, they take care of what you really can't control. And, but everything else, uh, in, in a way you're like, um, in a way you're just being trained on how to use the God spark within you to take care of those things that, that are within your hands. Yeah. Especially when it involves nags and demonic stuff that's interfering. Yeah, no, I mean, I, the interview I was going to do, this was like good stuff that, it, it, so I was doing this reality creation, whatever you want to call it, this, uh, pushback, um, where I took it in my own hands for a good reason, like all that stuff you were talking about earlier, like when it's coming from a good place with good intentions with, for a good outcome, positive, you know, then absolutely. Right. And, and that was what I was doing. I had good intentions. It was a, a good interview. It was meant to happen. It was supposed to happen. It was going to be something for the good guys, not the bad guys, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now those particular shows though, you were talking about, what were you talking about on the first one with Jeff? I think I was um, actually talking about eggs and interference. <laughs> Okay. Funny enough. And then the second show was about 
all about nags, like two and a half hours about just everything and anything to do with what nags are, all the different types, all the ways in which they operate and their little shenanigans and tricks and and what we can do, you know, to kind of like fight back against them. So in both cases, the interviews were a direct burn against them, you could say. Yeah. So no wonder, no wonder they were so, uh, antagonistic back yeah. towards you. Right? Yeah. I was like poking the hornet's nest basically. Yeah. And I did notice that there's a, a metaphysical principle where if you step on the dark forces territory, then they can step on yours. Right. Yeah. Yes. Good point. Yes. Right. And so when that is allowed within the greater, I don't know, metaphysical cosmic laws, then that's why higher forces can't necessarily just step in and st- prevent it without you even knowing it. Right. Because in a way you, you kind of earn. You already exerted your free yeah. will to poke the hornet's nest in the first place. Yeah. You earned the burn. Right. So well, if you're going to step up and, and go, you know, get in the octagon, so to speak, and mm-hmm. poke a hornet's nest, then you're also going to be adult enough to face the consequences. And, you know, and then when they come at you, you got to do something about it. Like it's on you basically. Yeah. Right. And so when it is on you, then as you just said, it, it's up to you to apply whatever methods and powers that you have to counter that. Cause you're the one that's in the boxing ring now. Yeah. So, yeah. So it makes sense then that that is definitely another application of, of using metaphysical powers for good mm-hmm. when it's in your hands. And why is it in your hands? Because you earned the burn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 